So thank you. Um, so now we have the, the last um, you know, session of this Avenue conference, you know, um, which is probably not the least actually, um, um, important topic, actually, which is the, um, the um, financial um, aspect of this. So I'm, I'm the um, chair of this panel, and I figured that I would, I have a couple of slides from my country, um, Iceland, on the current situation, which I think that um, are in a um, fit very uh, neatly with the you know, discussion previously on the, um, on the you know, labor market. So this, this is the policy rate in Iceland. And in fact, uh, just, just before I came to this conference on, on Wednesday, we raised the policy rate by 125 persons. And, and, and this is a policy response. We are using wanted policy to basically to cool an overheating um, economy. As you, you can see, uh, inflation in, in most of the countries is beginning to slide, but it's uh, starting to um, rise um, in our country, or not, uh, not um, going down. Um, inflation in Iceland is now about 9.5%. And has been on this level now for like six months. Um, um, one of the main problems is the um, labor market, because we've seen Iceland is probably the only country in Europe where the um, people have, where the um, people have not taken a real wage cut, actually, because nominal wage increases have kept up with um, inflation. And what we are about to see might be the uh, beginning of a uh, wage um, inflation spiral. And uh, that is one of the reasons for why we decided to take this very drastic measure. And, um, and this comes on top um, of a um, situation that we have an economy that is growing very rapidly. And the turn of um, events in, uh, in the world in the past one or two years has actually um, been a very positive supply shock for us. First of all, uh, price of our exports are um, increasing. Our main exports are actually um, aluminum, um, fish, and then the tourist sector is booming. And especially um, uh, uh, visitors from the uh, US. But it's, but it's more than that because what has basically happened is that the value of resources has increased. Because Iceland is mostly carbon free. 90% uh, of our households use uh, thermal energy for heating. Um, so, um, so what we're now seeing is an increased interest in um, investment in our country. And um, in various aspects. But um, this is uh, a slide just telling about the, the population increase. Uh, Iceland is a very um, young population. The population growth has been very rapid by natural causes. Um, Icelandic women tend to have many kids compared with what is in, 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 in the Europe. But also we have seen a, a huge inflow of labor. We are part of the European um, economic area. And we have seen, I mean, all, all, of the, all of Western Europe has seen an influx of uh, foreign labor, but Iceland is basically um, exceptional. Uh, population is growing very rapidly. And, um, and this is our actual growth path. We, we have a much higher um, rate of uh, long-term growth. And um, growth last year was about 6 7% real, and we project it to be 5% this year. And, um, and, um, and, and, and what we've seen also see that, um, I think there was this phrase yesterday by, by um, I think that uh, a quote in Max Fritz that we uh, imported labor, but we, what we got was people, because, because the, the the foreign workers, they need a place to stay. And um, increasingly, people, foreign workers that, uh, that come to a country, they um, increasingly are buying houses. 
and uh, want to stay um, in our country. And that is creating a, a huge housing uh, shortage and, um, and uh, you know, rising housing prices. And um, now currently about 20, 25% of labor force is foreign born. And um, so far the, this has been going quite well. There hasn't, haven't been any serious problems. Um, well, of xenophobia or, or anything like that, we, um, most of the people that we that um, are, are in our country have, are, are just, it is basically recognized in Iceland that the, these foreign workers are basically have a positive impact on, on our, our economy. After the financial crisis, we, as I will tell you, but we, we have been quite focused on, on keeping leverage down because we got into this financial bubble a huge inflow of uh, foreign um, capital, which then end, ended in a, in a crisis. So, so as I will show you, we have been following a policy of very strict macroprudential measures to keep leverage down, also to keep the foreign exposure of the economy um, at a minimum. And, um, and just, just to recap, we, we had, a, in 2008, we had a um, uh, financial crisis, uh, systematic banking collapse, um, and, um, and I would like to quote uh, Giovanni in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a pan yesterday saying that uh, there are financial stabilizers if the system is closed. Of course, if the, if the, if the um, system is open and money is trying to flee out of the country, it becomes a disaster. As it, as it was with us. So, so in order to, to take control over financial system, we did two things, uh, capital controls and also um, complete uh, deposit um, insurance, which basically gave us time to reorganize the banking sector and which was basically cut down. You had a banking system that was 10 times our output and we basically we took forth uh, mature uh, rights to to cut the banks in two parts, foreign part that was put into liquidation and the domestic part that was recapitalized. And behind cap capital controls, we um, um, basically built a, a new financial system. The, the controls were basically abolished. And uh, I would like to mention that the, we, we, we were in a, the capital co controls, they were operated with, within the um, care of the IMF and, and uh, the um, leader of the, of the uh, IMF um, contingent in Iceland is, is here, Paul, Paul Thompson. He was actually sent to Iceland in 2008. And, um, and it's basically the, the Icelandic case also proved to be a um, kind of a policy change with the um, IMF. So, so what have we uh, done since? First of all, uh, it was very clear that we had to uh, integrate and uh, distribute responsibility for monetary policy, financial stability, and supervision, which basically means giving it to the central bank. And um, so the central bank, which I represent, has basically a full mandate in financial stability, supervision, and monetary policy. So if, if something goes wrong, it's very clear who is to blame. Uh, they will just take me away, I guess. Um, but that, that has uh, given us a level of control. Um, we have also accumulated a lot of foreign reserves. We used the tourist boom to accumulate reserves, which are now about 35% of our GDP. We have been using these reserves to manage the, the currency market, um, to uh, keep it uh, stable. Um, there are very strict con controls of how you can take uh, on um, external debt, because in a small open economy, um, accumulating foreign debt can become an um, externality to others. And, uh, and also we limit the, also the, the use of FX futures, which are the main vehicles for credit trade or, or that. Secondly, um, uh, we um, enforce very high capital ratios of the banks, uh, between 20 30 percent. Um, we have borrower-based measures. You cannot get a mortgage in Iceland unless that you have, there is a 75, you have to have 25% equity. 
to being able to get the Morty, for example, um, and um, and uh, and then very strict um, financial um, regulation. And um, and and there are actually a couple of lessons I, I would like to take from this because I, I see that the um, essentially um, um, that the um, the actually American banking system is uh, there are um, is in a uh, I think in a in a um, kind of a systematic trouble given that the banks there they, they have always when you um, implement the monetary tightening there is a loss that is created it is just a question of who who bears the losses and it's why very clear that given the bond holdings or the U.S. banking system that that the the um, um, equity ratios, or the market, <coughs> or the market value of other equity is is lower or even zero. And secondly, uh, as we've seen, there, there is a um, lack of credibility, or that the supervision is sufficiently um, effective. So I see that the so-called systematic risk. Um, exception, which, uh, which, the, uh, which the has been um, implemented, is basically, and in fact, a complete deposit guarantee. And uh, which I think that um, cannot be basically abolished un unless that there are done some structural changes in the in the um, in the American system. Um, but otherwise. Um, um, otherwise, I, I think that the main question is of the, how the macro proof net, how the, how the, 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 the new macro proof uh, measures, how, how effectively they have been um, implemented. And I have the belief that, that in the European economy or within the um, confines of the ECP, I, I believe that they have implemented effective um, financial stability measures. So, which actually give, gives you hope. Um, having said that, I, I would like to give the floor to to actually uh, to your dear young that's uh, Thank you very much. Okay, so we have the good spot, 4.30 on a Saturday afternoon with lovely sunshine outside. Um, so thank you for the invite. Lovely to be here again. And we've been asked three questions on this panel, um, focused on what's happened in the banking system over the course of the last few months. So question one, are the failures that we've seen the result of idiosyncratic shocks or are the underlying vulnerabilities wider and more systemic? Two, what areas of financial stability require greatest attention? And, and three, what policy responses will be most appropriate, um, depending on, on those outcomes? So question one, are failures a result of idiosyncratic shocks, are the failures we've seen in the last um, few months? And we're almost two years into this hiking cycle. And I spoke here last year, and I was pretty downbeat in what I said, both in terms of the outlook for financial markets and, and for the real economy. We had war, we had risks from energy supply in Europe. We'd elevated inflation with the real sense that central banks had lost a little bit of control and needed to catch up quick. 
Um, and, and we had you know, continued US-China tensions that, that we hadn't seen in the past. And, and I've been surprised by the resilience that we've seen both in financial markets and in the global economy in the past year. Now, in part, I think some things turned out more positively than we expected, the energy crisis, China reopening. Um, but activity in labor markets have been a lot more resilient than they've been in the past. Um, and I would say that also holds for some of the large liquid emerging markets out there. And they started hiking a whole year before the Fed um, began to hike and, and have not yet begun to cut. Um, and labor markets and EM still haven't adjusted. They're still, they're still pretty tight. Um, markets have been pretty, I don't know if markets have been surprised, but markets have definitely been resilient. So on this chart here, what I show you is um, the VIX index, which is volatility and equity prices. And it's, it's been a little bit volatile, but right now it's, it's, it's converged to relatively contained levels. And it has been able to absorb increased volatility in interest rates. That's the move index, it's US Treasuries. Um, so, so we have a significant gap there, and the real economy in developed markets has been able so far to um, absorb that gap. It, it's not that there's been no stress in financial markets. We've had crypto, we've had LDI in the UK last September, October. We've had three regional banks needing to be addressed in the US. Um, okay. Higher rates have unmasked some vulnerabilities in the global financial system. Um, but to me, um, relatively limited at this point. Um, and I think those vulnerabilities were associated with poor supervision to some extent and, and excess risk taking. So, so, so pretty contained. Um, is that idiosyncratic? Um, there's a common element, which I think is the cost of capital, but um, there were some idiosyncratic aspects to the institutions impacted. So our underlying vulnerabilities um, wider and more systemic, and we're just about to see them, or we'll see them in the next six to 12 months. Let me address that for the banking system first. And my answer there is probably not. Um, so what I did here is I looked at bank lending to the non-financial sector as a percent of GDP. Um, where is it today relative to its long-term history? And where was it just at the end of 2007 relative to its long-term history. Um, if we look at the largest economic areas of the world, whether it's the US or the Eurozone, in terms of financial systems and openness and systematic risk to the rest of the global economy, the US and the Eurozone are in a much better position today in terms of their banks than we were 15 years ago. Um, there are areas of potential vulnerability, um, I think, it's not controversial to say that China is going through a multi-year balance sheet adjustment, and because of that adjustment that needs to happen in the property and banking system, it won't be the source of growth to the world that it was for the last couple of decades. Japan hasn't tried to increase interest rates yet. Um, we've been talking about it for a long time. Maybe they don't get there, but if they do, um, let, let's keep an eye on that. Um, but in terms of large, banking systems around the world, the US and Eurozone seem, seem pretty protected um, at this point. And, and how did we get there? I think we have to, I mean, the way I think about it, central banks and supervisors played a really good um, game of whack-a-mole. So as central bank balance sheets expanded, as global liquidity increased, there was an ability to contain risk within the banking systems, whether that was from um, risk weights, loan-to-value ratios, um, caps on um, loan-to-income ratios. It has broadly worked in containing um, risks. I guess the second part to it is there is a scarring aspect from what happened during the GFC. Um, unfortunately, we're, we don't tend to be rational and we shift from excess to something that is, that is the opposite. And it does, it does impact behavior for some time to come. Now, if there isn't a problem in the banking systems, um, are there other areas of financial stability that, that may be at risk? Um, I did this chart for a larger number of economies. We can talk about it if you wish. But I guess one thing that's on my mind is banking systems don't seem to be leveraged the way they were in the past in the US and Europe. But there's a lot of money sloshing around the system. 
Um, and where has that money gone to? Um, I think we know that money is porous and it finds, it, it finds its way into um, risk-taking activities over time, particularly when interest rates are low for a long period of time. Um, that leaves me open to potential shocks from the non-bank financial system. And in particular, a concern that while we have very good supervision of banks at this time, we probably have less of an understanding of what's going on in non-bank financial sectors of the economy. Um, is that a done deal? No, but I think it is um, something to, to keep an eye on. Um, last couple of points. So let me um, catch up on where I was. Um, so are we being complacent in the light of M2 to GDP, in the light of a lot of, a lot of liquidity sloshing around the system? Does that mean we're in for a hard landing? Um, does that mean we're open to some significant liquidity risks over the course of the next few quarters and years? Possibly. I guess one thing I'd like to say is that I wonder if our mindsets have shifted a little. We've had such two very large crises in such a short period of time. Um, we've become, I guess, trained to think about very large contractions in activity. Um, are we moving in that direction? Maybe not. Should we think about a standard recession? I think that's something that we should be open to, and that's something that these risks could, could open us up to. Um, I want to combine that, though, with what I, I guess, a pretty negative view last year and what I've learned from this conference this year and I guess a couple of things I'm still struggling with. So I guess what we've heard is we can have a standard adjustment. We can get inflation back to target with a gradual adjustment in output gaps. Policy works. That's how it's supposed to work. Excuse me. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, maybe we're in a different labor market environment. We can get inflation down without a large or average adjustment in unemployment. Think a couple of percentage points. So far, labor markets have been um, very resilient. Um, maybe we are in an environment where private sector balance sheets are solid enough that they can absorb a slowdown in credit. Um, the Atlanta Fed put out a nice note yesterday um, citing a survey they have done. Um, most firms do not anticipate seeking funding in the next 12 months. 60% of respondents indicated that they had enough cash on hand to execute their current plans. Um, one third of these firms did not want to accrue further debt. That's a pretty comfortable position to be in. Um, maybe we are in an environment where central bank balance sheets have grown very rapidly. They will gradually reverse from here. It's not a process we've undergone so far, but it is something that we can absorb. Um, my sense is in that world, we'll see more little surprises, we'll see more LDIs, we'll see more SVBs, but so far those have been pretty manageable over the course of the last six to nine months. There's been temporary stress in the system, but we've been able to adjust. Um, what's the right policy response in that world? I guess we're here, so we continue to differentiate monetary policy from liquidity provision. Monetary policy continues to adjust as it needs to, um, and interest rates continue as they just, to adjust as they need to, to tackle inflation. But we can deliver temporary liquidity injections. Quite unusual that that's happened in the past, but it's happened. Maybe fiscal policy helps us out in getting inflation back to target. Um, there's a lot of maybes in there, um, and I hope those maybes come true. If they do come true, um, we're going to, I guess we're going to rewrite the history books in terms of, in terms of economics going forward. That's it. Thank you. So, um, 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 should I go? Yes. Um, go thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, it's... Uh, both a pleasure and again a privilege to uh, to be back at the Dubrovnik conference. So ma many thanks to uh, Boris Tomislav and the whole organization team at the National Bank. 
uh, and, um, and echoing it, earlier speakers' congratulations for having got the euro. Uh, it's a major achievement, and especially considering that in this country, uh, I think the central bank has contributed probably more than in others uh, to the, that adoption, so uh, bravo. Um, I don't have slides, so I feel uh, very uh, defensive after the previous speakers, um, but um, I will make a few points about, centered about the U.S. banking situation, and I think we heard uh, a pretty optimistic take, <coughs> both from Giovanni Della Riccia yesterday and from Gillian uh, just, uh, just right now, um, at least uh, in terms of the baseline understanding. Um, I'm not going to express uh, an actual disagreement with what they said, but, uh, but look more at the downside risks and uh, what if uh, things are actually not that okay. Uh, so I will comment on uh, U.S. supervisory failure on what I find intriguing crisis management, uh, especially in the case of Silicon Valley Bank. I will draw the contrast with Europe and particularly the Eurozone. Um, so this is a U.S. banking problem rather than a global banking problem. I'm not going to say much about Switzerland, but we may come back to it in the Q&A. Uh, if there is interest, then I will say a few uh, very uh, brief words about the outlook. So taking a step back, what happened? I mean, obviously, if we had had this discussion three months ago, and that's not a long time ago, uh, we would not have talked about risks in the banking, uh, U.S. banking sector at all. So it was not on the radar. It took everybody by surprise, uh, including myself, of course. Uh, I think it's worth uh, remembering that also in terms of what that means for what may be the next steps. What we have seen uh, is what I think can fairly be labeled an astonishing uh, failure of U.S. banking supervision. Uh, that involves more or less all um, supervisory authorities in the U.S., including state-level authorities in states like California and New York, um, the Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation, which has a backup supervisory role for all banks and was the principal federal uh, supervisor for Signature Bank in particular, but first and foremost, the U.S. Federal Reserve, and this is where it hurts most, I think, because the Federal Reserve used to have a, a very high reputation in terms of banking supervision, safety and soundness. Uh, and what happened, I will focus mostly on Silicon Valley Bank, is really a, a failure of the basics of banking supervision. It's nothing fancy. And if you look back at 2007, 2008, the Federal Reserve, I think, can be uh, correctly blamed for not having been able to prevent bank holding companies in large complex banking organizations like Citibank and others from being exposed to complex financial engineering in, uh, of balance sheet um, structured finance, etc. cetera. Uh, but that was pretty complicated. What happened with Silicon Valley Bank was basic uh, points of uh, business model risk and interest rate risk, which uh, really is a kind of uh, ba uh, most uh, fundamental layer of supervision, so supervision 101. And I think the reason I'm insisting on this, uh, having uh, had the opportunity to look at, at other episodes of uh, systemically significant supervisory failure, including Japan in the 90s, um, but uh, most uh, prominently for our collective memories, the Eurozone in the late 2000s and early 2010s, is that when there is a systemically significant supervisory failure, uh, the consequences can be very vast and very uh, disruptive. So crisis management, I said it was intriguing. Uh, if you remember, uh, there was a lot of uh, drama and apparent changes of direction in the first weekend when uh, Silicon Valley Bank was handled. Uh, the FDIC uh, initially suggested that they would uh, basically take a liquidative approach with partial reimbursement of deposits. Uh, and that this would be okay, and then there were uh, multiple changes of direction in how to deal with it during the weekend. The weekend ended at uh, 6.15 p.m. on Sunday, uh, March 12th, with the triggering of what the U.S. Uh, regulatory system calls a systemic risk exception. So the big question here, and that was the instrument, as Governor Janssen reminded us, uh, through which... Uh, the deposits of those two banks, but also by implication of any banks that would be in a situation that might be similar in the foreseeable future, um, were guaranteed without limit. 
So now the vocabulary is interesting. It's a systemic risk exemption. So the Fed has been kind of talking it both ways by saying, you know, there is no systemic fragilities. These are idiosyncratic situations that needed to be dealt with in an idiosyncratic way, as Gillian also said. Um, but uh, at the same time, it's a systemic risk exemption. So where is the systemic risk? I think that's a big question. And there are two uh, kind of not mutually incompatible but very different views on, uh, on this situation. One, one was um, the systemic risk exemption was uh, triggered for motivations which actually had very little to do with systemic risk. It was a matter of industrial policy, in a nutshell, bailing out Silicon Valley, if not bailing out, out Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, you know, the uh, confrontation with China, we cannot afford to have a big downturn in our most innovative uh, cluster of business and uh, also, you know, matters of, you know, um, big donors, I don't know. So a very political slash uh, geoeconomic slash industrial policy view of the motivation for the decision, having little to do, if so, uh, with uh, motivations about uh, systemic risk in the financial system and contagion to other banks. I don't think this, I, initially I, I thought this explanation was most of the decision. Now I'm much less convinced about this, so I've shifted my views, partly uh, listening to what the IMF has had to say, including what uh, Gio Giovanni told us yesterday on in terms of you know corporate treasurers be, being very um, um, febrile. The other explanation being indeed that there were there was systemic risk. There were a number of other banks uh, where contagion would have been unmanageable had the systemic risk exemption not uh, been triggered. But then that points. Uh, I'm aware of what Giovanni said yesterday about multiple equilibria and self-fulfilling um, uh, propositions. At the same time. I think if the view at the Fed was that the other banks uh, were basically sound, balance sheet wise, but vulnerable to deposit flight because of a panic, then uh, I think it might have been uh, manageable with liquidity provision. The point here being that the systemic risk exemption in a situation where systemic risk was not ex ante obvious is a very radical decision which is not just ordinary crisis management. This is a, in, in, quite possibly a regime change in terms of U.S. deposit insurance, despite what the authorities have said that this was just for those two banks, uh, and uh, therefore something that uh, I'm sure was not considered likely. So contrast that with uh, what's happening in Europe and the Eurozone, and here maybe I'm motivated to insist on this by the extraordinarily pessimistic uh, framings that we heard from Poole Thompson, but actually that's what I was planning to talk about even before hearing that. Um, so far, ostensibly, we've seen comparatively very high effectiveness of European banking supervision that's uh, strengthened by the accession of Croatia, because of Croatia, of course, comes from uh, a, point, a starting point of very effective supervision. But more generally, in the Eurozone, we haven't seen any indications of comparable uh, weakness in the banking system. And of course, it's too early for definitive conclusions, either about the US, is there more fragility in the banking sector, or about the EU, uh, is there really no fragility in the banking sector? But so far, that's the picture. Let me conclude on the outlook. As I said before, the historical pattern suggests that um, widespread broad-based supervisory failure can have disruptive consequences, you can have zombification in the banking system, and indeed, like in Iceland, uh, the consequence is often a complete change in the institutional architecture of banking supervision. So in Iceland, it was the concentration of all the responsibilities uh, into the central bank. It's very difficult to think what forms that could take in the US. Uh, in, in a way, it's almost thinking the unsinkable. The Fed has been in at the center of the US system for so long that it's very difficult to imagine a reform that would substantially change that. Of course, such a reform would not be justified by what we have seen so far, but again, if, it, if indeed it's only the beginning of a sequence, uh, then um, many things uh, become thinkable. Now, of course, there is an alternative scenario, which is the one that Gillian uh, hinted at, which is much more optimistic. Uh, I will just end by uh, reflecting on 
uh, previous moves uh, to extend deposit insurance to all deposits, and as we remember, uh, that was done both in Iceland and in uh, for domestic deposits, uh, and in Ireland. You remember the joke at the time was the difference between Ireland and Iceland, uh, one letter and six months. Um, so um, in Ireland, the deposit insurance uh, was for two years, and as that deadline approached uh, in uh, 2010, actually, that accelerated <coughs> the crisis in the Irish banking sector, which ended up uh, with a sovereign crisis and the need to request uh, IMF and Eurozone uh, assistance. So that was not a very good story. Conversely, in Iceland, uh, as the governor reminded us, the full protection of deposits could be successfully removed uh, after seven years, uh, which is a relatively long period. So the situation now in the US is that as I understand it, and I think as the U.S. authorities have wanted depositors in regional and small community banks to understand it, that deposits are fully safe and not at risk at all. Uh, that means that if another bank was to have the same problem as Silicon Valley Bank, it was not necessary for First Republic, but it was for Signature Bank, so systemic risk uh, exception might be uh, invoked uh, once again. Um, it will be interesting to see how that evolves, uh, not just in the next few weeks, but in the next few years. Thanks very much. Thank you. We we'll just one, one you want to um, speak first. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. We'll, okay. okay. Um, thank you once more for inviting me. It's uh, very nice to be back in the old world of central banking. It's a little bit actually even strange, but already the day after tomorrow, I will be back among my fellow bankers and complaining, of course, as usually about, uh, about the supervisors. Um, let me maybe just quote you four reasons why do I think that uh, this is a uh, idiosyncratic shock and that's Things uh, like happened there in the US cannot uh, happen here. Um, in Europe, and especially here in the CEE region, that's I know pretty well, including my own bank. First of all, uh, banks uh, are well capitalized. I can actually even say even over capitalized to some extent. But uh, there is a good reason behind that one. And I don't know if you still remember two, three years ago, European banks complaining that's vis-a-vis -vis the US banks, you know, how much more restrictive the regulation here is, and that we feel not competitive, so to say, vis-a-vis -vis the US banks. So again, if you look purely to the numbers, I mean, definitely substantially more capital, just like the uh, governor mentioned, I mean, substantially, in most of the cases, even 20%. That's number one. Number two, um, we all issued our MREL bonds, um, like it or not, but it's here. We issued, I mean, uh, we were, I can say, uh, smart. We issued that last year on January 31st, just 24 days before uh, uh, the beginning of the war. And that's time it cost us like three and a half, four percent. The majority of our competitors issued that during the last couple of months. Um, so if there are some investors here who are interested to uh, uh, make eight, nine percent in euros and, and, uh, and, and, and dollars, I mean more than welcome to buy any of these bonds of our competitors. So again, uh, um, usually the rate uh, banks got is somewhere below between 20 and 30 percent of their core capital. So again, we issued 400 million. And uh, again, that is a uh, additional buffer. Um, learning a little bit uh, uh, what's going on once uh, bank failure is taking place, just in case of uh, Sberbank. And it's very interesting when you see that all of these memoranda and, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch my back, how it works. But when it's about hard cash, you know, it's usually Austria first, Hungary first, Croatia first, everybody looks to himself. So I mean, uh, we are one of those banking groups which went with multiple point of entry, meaning in every single country we issued, so to say, our no embryo bonds. So, we're capitalized uh, uh, issuance of embryo bonds. Um, knowing it's which macroeconomic conditions we are uh, active, um, we were actually not extremely greedy when it's about the average tenure or our govis are concerned. Yeah? So in Hungary, uh, uh, we were about three and a half years. Uh, maybe some banks stretched a little bit, but I mean, there were hardly any banks that, so to say, went above five years plus. 
Um, looking back into our <coughs> historical mirror, what was the interest rate change during the last couple of years? You know, we had to be cautious. Yeah. Uh, and of course, once the interest rate shot up, it's completely different if the average maturity is only three and a half years or if your average mat maturity is, so to say, five, 10, or even in even a uh, uh, longer time period. So that's the third reason, that's the average maturity is much longer of these GAVIs that we usually purchase. And, and fourth, um, look what happened in the region. We got tested in most of the countries, from Czech Republic to Poland, from Hungary to Romania, um, with uh, real stress tests, not a theoretical one, where the reference rate went up by 5, 10, even higher in Hungary, from 2%, we went up to 18% in a time period of uh, nine months. And I'm still here, yeah? I'm still talking, and we survived, and uh, don't ask me how. Uh -huh. But uh, again, I do hope that the EC business stress trust is not going to work with 5 or 10%, yeah? because probably on the paper we will not be able to survive, but you know, in reality, we did survive. So again, uh, you can see that uh, 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 in practice, uh, uh, we were able to manage it. So that's, so to say, uh, the nicer part of the story, the sunnier part. Um, and um, maybe just two, three sentences, why I'm um, still concerned and um, what are, so to say, our troubles. Just like all of you, of course, also us, yeah, we would love the inflation come down. But I think we all underestimate what's the price of this uh, uh, inflation reduction. Uh, uh, our gas storages are full with gas that was purchased for 100, 120 dollars, or <coughs> you know, 80, 90. Our grain storage is full with grain, uh, 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 and I can go on and on, and. Falling inflation means that uh, uh, all of these expensive stuff that we have already purchased is going to face the lack of demand. Yeah? <laughs> and we will be selling now things below, so to say, the price we have paid for. Yeah? Let's be frank. And uh, this is not going to be fun. The balance sheet of this year by far are not going to look as nicely as they look for 2022. I mean, inflation does great things with balance sheets, then, yeah? Everybody makes money, yeah? So, again, 2023, <coughs> and I think the hardest part is coming right now, when the construction industry, you know, build up a square meter, and they decide, you know, they can not only break even point, they have to sell it below price. Uh, uh, gas cannot be sold at the price you purchase, you know? Uh, 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 even loans probably cannot be sold at the price that we, we, we were dreaming of. And uh, I think that is something we have to be uh, um, very, very aware of, what kind of challenges we are, being, we are going to face as the inflation is slowing down. I'm not telling that we are against it. Again, we all love it, but you know, just like once you get sick, there is a certain price you need to pay in order to get out of that sickness which is not only a cheap one. And um, I think these are the issues that are concerning us as we see that uh, uh, demand is falling, uh, uh, as, uh, as we see that uh, 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 you know, a lot of people made bets on increasing inflation even further. And again, as we see that uh, 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 the balance sheet again of our clients are going to be looked differently and banks are nothing else than the mirror of, the, of their own clients, and probably it will have a substantial negative effects on us as the time is passing as well. We do hope that we will all succeed, meaning to bring down that inflation, but again, it will have price, a certain price, and I think it's very important that everybody is aware of that one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Okay. Uh, I would tend to agree a great deal with previous speaker, especially with Nicholas, but I would anyway take a bit different, uh, different perspective. 
So we all remember and we are always coming back to 2008 uh, when, you know, during summer there were some strange sounds coming, some funds stopped paying out their shares, uh, some investment banks suddenly got bought under strange circumstances, but nothing looked really, really bad yet. Uh, then in September, one investment bank, not even real bank, collapsed with a balance sheet of $700 billion plus a few hundred billion dollars under management, and world suddenly found itself into first global recession after 1929. So whenever we see similar things going on, question pop up, is it coming again? And uh, what I think we can comfortably say now, after all those speakers we heard, uh, I'm in very comfortable position to say it's not coming again yet, for the time being. So uh, what we see now is a problem in individual banks. And this is problem that happened, you know, if we, if we say 2008, 2008 was consequence of uh, having rug over rotten floor. And suddenly someone stepped on rug and went through floor. Uh, because uh, the substance, problem was in substance. Problem was in thousands of billions of housing loans that people didn't want to pay. And did they also had legal right not to pay them. And those loans uh, created substance of American real estate market. And, you know, net assets of American households went down for 50% uh, within a year. And this is uh, the biggest shock ever, bigger than 1929. And therefore, subsequent cri crisis was rather mild compared with initial shock. Uh, what happened now is very different situation. Now we have firm floor, it looks like at least, you never know for sure, but it looks quite firm, but it's rotten rug on top of it. And uh, yes, uh, then supervisors come from time to time, we can agree, we disagree, Nicholas said uh, certain views. I, I wouldn't say that then that tough language he used. Uh, I would say that Fed was probably a bit too relaxed. And also that Fed relayed on something, unfortunately, we in U EU are incapable to rely on. And this is a resolution authority with 90 years and few thousand banks of experience. And this resolution authority moved in Although looking at size of balance sheet, combining uh, those American banks and Credit Suisse, shock was bigger than 2008. Now that's, that was 700 billion and this is about 600 billion in US plus 530 billion in, in the Swiss plus 1,300 billion in, in assets under management in Switzerland. Therefore, it was quite substantial shock in financial sector but for the time being, it went quite smooth. And uh, all actions of resolution authorities, bo both in, in uh, Switzerland, which I didn't like. Don't, don't quote me that I like them. I didn't like what they did, but they did it well, uh, looking from consequences. Uh, in the United States, they did it marvelously. They mopped up 2% of banking system with net cost of $10 billion. For that price, they can mop up the whole banking system and walk happily. So uh, they, need, they wouldn't need to do it, of course. Uh, but generally speaking, I think concerning, uh, concerning uh, global financial stability in this moment from what we saw, and if, even if uh, FDIC move in and close several more banks, I don't think that it could be any kind of source of global instability. Uh, now going selfishly to our side of Atlantic and talking about EU and European banks, uh, I would say based on experience of 2008 that there is no risk we can see consequences soon because consequences of 2008 were visible in EU in 2012 to 2015. Therefore, system reacts with three to five years of delay, and uh, it moves through asset quality. 
And uh, therefore, until we see that anything is going on in asset quality, it will take a few years. Uh, but also, I don't think that what happened now in the United States will have any consequences in asset qualities in EU. There are other forces going on there. Uh, anyway, uh, what I would, of course, feel slightly, uh, uh, how to say, incentivized to mention, to react, is on Radovan's statement about uh, overcapitalization of European banks, which I would naturally and strongly disagree. Uh, we are still uh, in EU at about 60% of global average, without MREL, sorry, that's, that's something I, I didn't count on. And 60% uh, of global average is not overcapitalization. We can discuss whether they are capitalized enough or not, but overcapitalization is maybe too much to say. So thank you very much for your attention.